Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. So we're, I know we're taking longer than normal to get into this because um, there's a lot to dive in when it comes to acts. And um, if y'all can't hear me on the Zoom or on Facebook or anything, let us know. Um, but there's a lot to take in when it comes to the acts. And so we finished, we got to chapter eight or verse eight last week. So let's continue forward. So if someone can get verses nine through 11 real fast. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, uh, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So, quick recap or quick questioning. So, what's happened so far? What are the first eight verses? What has happened? So, we saw. We talked about uh, the. Apostles receiving the Holy Spirit. It's coming to, it's about to come right. to the Holy Spirit. Oh, is it about to happen? But they're, but they're, they've been hearing for 40 days about the kingdom, and they, they have thought this whole time that the physical kingdom, and they want to know when he's going to restore the kingdom. Yes, that's a, that's a good one, because that's one we've constantly oh, looked at, even when we're looking at the gospel accounts. Yeah. Something that's got to be unlearned and learned again, as we said before, you unlearn it and relearn it. Uh, another thing is, too, is Christ has told them, you know, where to go to teach the order, a more specific order. So if you look at, you know, the corresponding account, Luke's account, it's just, you know, the other gospel accounts is typically just all to the world. But here in Acts, we're seeing, you know, he wants to start first Jerusalem, Judea, then Samaria, and then, you know, keep going and keep going. And so we're seeing that going forward a more specific direction for the apostles to go out and teach so it's kind of breaking it down more into a detail and so as we just read in these verses we saw christ ascend finally so jesus ascends into a, a cloud out of the apostle site so i just think that's kind of picture that imagery like how do y'all picture it just like is he is he like floating by himself or is he floating on a you know cloud come up because I, I imagine him ascending into heaven by himself and they're just staring and a cloud covers over so they're just staring at this cloud right? so, i don't see that he was floating on a cloud that's like mario well i asked that because i want us to start kind of like looking at how some of these things or related instances are also portrayed in modern media as well so that could also get, give a misinterpretation of what's going on. So, but I just think it's also a really cool imagery to just picture Christ ascends into heaven. It's showing his, you know, that he has a divine power in a sense. He's not just normal God, Jesus over here. But, and then we go into verse 10. There's two men in white clothing who stood by the apostles and they look steadfast. So who were these two men? You think about uh, any time, you know, when Abraham met two men, mm -hmm. um, you know, they were telling him about Sarah's going to give birth, but she you know, doesn't die. Two were, men, two men also going to were, save Lot, or they were angels, yeah, and then they went on to, to uh, the Lot, yeah. So, they were angels. what I don't, and I don't really, I don't have a, I don't have an answer. I just have kind of like a, I don't want to throw it out to y'all, like, why does it say these two men are not angels? Well, I wonder why there's not a, a specific description. That's something I was wondering. Do you think in the context of a Jewish audience, when you say two men in white robes, mm -hmm. is there, I mean, maybe Ben might be the person to answer this, but is that like a, a way of signifying an angel? Or is that, I mean, maybe an angel? Or could it just be that uh, certainly possible that Good, yeah. I mean, I'm on the impression that they were angels just because of how y'all said it. You know, we have the previous accounts of two men back in, you know, from Genesis. In, in Luke 24, this is Luke. 
same author, mm -hmm. 24 4, says, While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel and said, uh, uh, And as they were frightened and bowed their face to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek living among the dead? So this is as at the resurrection, so they're in dazzling apparel. So, the white apparel, the dazzling apparel, I'm not going to read on this, but it seems similar. Um, they're assumed to be the angels. Um, yeah, and he, Hebrews 13 1 and following talks about be careful to entertain, entertain strangers, for some have, by so doing, some have entertained angels on a way. Well, so strangers and angels are seen as the same. Yeah, and if, if you want to go to John 20 12. So, Luke 24 4 that you just mentioned, that was one of the verses. Um, the commentary, the World Video Bible School that I'm using, they they believe that for several reasons many speculate that these two men were actually angels blue 24 4 was one that they gave right. another was they brought a message which was that obviously came from god they brought a message and then this one uh, john 20 12. and she saw two angels and one sitting where the body of jesus was laying one at the head and one at the feet. so what's going on right here in john 20. what's the overall this is the after the desert uh -huh. so it's kind of giving a more confirmation about it and that's important because Luke calls them in, John calls them in. and that's important we, we need to realize there, there's the four different accounts or four different perspectives of what's going on in the same event and they also can be tied in times with like an act that we're seeing they're all related to each other right. it goes back to like what we were talking in the introductory class like we want to decompartmentalize these books at times and I think I do it all the time without even meaning to. We have to start stopping that, in a sense, because these books are not decompartmentalized. They are connected. You know, as we saw, Acts has connections with eight of the epistles. They give a better background on what's going on in the epistles and vice versa. So going forward, you know, I'm going to try my best. I will make some mistakes every now and then, but that's something that we need to practice in our daily lives when we're looking at these texts combining them because like john 20 shows it's a simple answer but if you just look at luke's account if you look at acts you can have people dispute oh, those are just normal men going around whether they're men or heavenly beings they are still bringing a message and they're angels mm -hmm. messengers and they're acting as, as messengers as angels yeah well, that also what do men of that day believe about they know that Jesus is going to return, so that gives an angelic understanding to their message as well. Um, they're messengers. Yeah. Is this, that's my thought. They, they brought a message, <clears throat> obviously came from God. Yep. And so we're going to go into verse 11 now. So two men, the angels, they address the apostles as men of Galilee. So remember this. This is going to be a very important uh, designation. You know, Christ's apostles, which will uh, be particularly important going into chapter two for them, the men of Galilee. So remember that. Um, then they announced that Jesus would come again in a like manner as they saw him go into heaven. So, uh, but what is significant of ref, uh, referring to his second coming as being in a like manner of his ascension? So that's the first question I have up here. Why is that significant? You know, he ascends up. Likewise, when he comes back, why is that significant? So one of the reasons why is his ascension is he ascended visibly. So shall, uh, so shall he return visibly, not secretly or invisibly, as many teach today. So this references to ver uh, Revelations 1-7. Um, but I think that's an important reference to look at is... We always talk about the end days, judgment days, gonna be like a thief in the night, but his ascension is not gonna be like a secret one. Like we will know it's going to be seen. And I think people get that confused at times. Um, there's a Netflix movie that came out. I think it was more on the Islamic view of Jesus returning because they also believe Christ is, or Jesus is gonna return as well. But they made it seem like 
it was more secretive, but what he was doing was spectacular and everyone was kind of like a YouTube clip, like confused. But when Christ, when he ascends back, descends back, I should say, we're all going to know it. It's not going to be a, a secret thing in a sense. I've got Revelation 1-7. Go for it. Yeah. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierce him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Hmm. Right, think of that imagery, all the tribes of the earth. So not just the tribes of Israel, everyone. And I will say, you know, Revelation 1, you know, you don't get into the imagery of Revelation until um, until a few chapters later. So here this is this would be taken literally. Uh -huh. yeah. That's my understanding. And then another thing, too, is he disappeared in the clouds, and so shall he return in the clouds. So we reference... Revelation 1 7. There's <clears throat> other verses like 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 that talk about it. The angels appear at his ascension, so shall they appear when he's coming back, and which we see in Matthew 25, 31, 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. His, he ascended in the bodily form. He shall come in some kind of bodily form, although we don't exactly know what that form will be like. And we get that from, uh, I think it's Philippians 3, 20 through 21, and also 1 John 3, 2. So he's going to come back all, all body and everything. It's not going to be, I know some face out there, I can't think of them on the top of my head. They think it's more of a spiritual return. And that's also going to be kind of, that also makes me think of kind of like the, the physicalness of the people that think the physical kingdom's coming back, but Christ himself will physically come back. So it's kind of a weird thing to think about. Um, another thing, point two is, while studying, while studying these verses, it's helpful to notice the importance of Christ's ascension back into heaven. And he had to, return, he had to return to heaven. And there's four reasons I have here. So the first reason is he had to return because he had to send the Holy Spirit back to the apostles to them yeah john 16 7 is a good reference for that another reason is he had a reign as king on the throne of his internal kingdom so that go, that goes back to daniel chapter 7 13 through 14 if someone wants to get those real fast this that's just a short little verse and seven, 13, 14. Mm -hmm. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So a physical kingdom will eventually what? Be destroyed. Be destroyed. We see that constantly in history. <clears throat> you know, even the great, like, even when we were saying the minor prophets, there was constant, you know, you saw the statues of the five metals, you know, one empire comes in and takes over the other, one comes in and takes over the other, you know, king, physical kingdoms come, the eternal kingdom lasts forever, and so he had to go back to be on his throne, for, you know. Um, third point, uh, to present his atoning blood as the once for all sacrifice for sin. So we get that reference back in Hebrews 9, 12 through 14, then 24 through 26 in the same chapter. But that's just a common, I think that's, that's an easy thing to understand, but I don't think we understand like the weight of it. Like his blood, is, his sacrifice is what's even giving us the possibility of going to heaven, to even reach it. And if he didn't do it, if he didn't, you know, atone and go through the whole process of ascending back. You know, if Christ, let's say if Christ didn't ascend back to heaven, he stayed. You know, who's going to rule the kingdom? You know, kind of going back to Daniel. And also, since he's back here on earth, like, what's the purpose of the atoning? What's the purpose of, what was the purpose for the sacrifice? of his, If he's not going to fall through all the way with it. You know, and the last part is, um, because, um, uh, let me see, where was, uh, all right, right here, be the Christian mediator, advocate, and, and, uh, insurrectionist, insurrectionist, if I can speak, 
thus giving us boldness to approach the throne of grace. So he also has to come back, going back to the last part, he just stayed here for the, you know, he has to go back because he has to advocate for us. And that's a tough call because we do horrible things all the time, whether we realize it or not. And so Christ, Father's will, God loves us so much that he put this in motion. And so those are four reasons. And then the last part, we look at, notice uh, the certainty of Jesus' second coming. So they are certain, these two men are saying that he's coming back. It's not a, well, maybe. It's a, he's going to, and he's going to come back like this. Don't worry, these angels. And Jesus said he would come back again. In John 14, 28, we see that. The angels said he's going to come back here. And then the apostles, they say it that he's going to come back. We see that um, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18, and also in 2 Peter 3, 4. So it's just kind of backing it up. Like, though he's gone back into heaven now, he's coming back. And though when he comes back, it's a thief of the night, he's going to come back. We're all going to see it. We're all going to know it, like Revelation 1, 7. It's not going to be like a secret little thing. It's like Da Vinci Co type thing going on some people like to do in the entertainment world and so Brandon, you mentioned that he got the kingdom in motion he set it in motion and that made me think of the stuff we read Daniel 7 but that's directly in relation to Daniel 2 mm-hmm. Nebuchadnezzar's dream um what the black was from Greek uh, in, Daniel, in Daniel 2 um the dream of Nebuchadnezzar of the of the four kingdoms, uh-huh. and the gold, the gold of the statue, it was a gold head, and then it had silver, bronze, iron, and clay mixed with clay. In yeah. the time of the fourth kingdom, which is Rome, a stone that was carved out of the rock, not with human hands, would destroy all those four kingdoms. And verse forty four said, "And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed." So you said get it in motion, and that's the rock, that's a rock coming down the mountain. Yep. <laughs> that's that's the kingdom in motion. Mm-hmm. Uh, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. So I just thought that that, that was important to bring out. And that and it's kind of it's kind of weird because when we do bring it up and we do understand that they're thinking more of the physical. If I was in that time. And someone kept saying it's a physical kingdom that's going to last forever. I would be very skeptical of that, even in that time, because it's like we, and maybe it's because we don't have as much history as we put ourselves back. It's kind of hard to say that putting yourself back in history. We like to see people do that today. You know, I wouldn't do that. So maybe mm-hmm. I'm kind of falling for that as well. But I feel like if I was in that time period, at some point I would say, we've seen, we, we've kind of seen these things come and go. Like, what do you mean by everlasting? Right. When you say is it physical, and but again, I am putting myself in that position. Maybe I am. Maybe I would think like that. Maybe. Yeah. But, but let's move forward. So, if someone wants to get uh, twelve through fourteen real fast, Skip, you want to get that? Then they returned to Jerusalem, the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey away. When they entered the city, they went to the upstairs room where they were staying. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, Alphaeus' son, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, James' son, all were united in their devotion to prayer along with some women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brother. So one of the first things I want to point out In verse 12, it says, The apostles returned to the Mount of Olives to Jerusalem as Jesus had commanded them back, you know, as we saw back in Luke 24, 49, and then here back in Acts 1, 4. So, but, so the question I have first is, how long is the Sabbath day journey? I just want us, it's not a trick question. I just want us to start kind of actually like, like I said in Mark, put your Roman hats on. Now put your hats on like 
being in there. How long is the Sabbath day journey? I just think it's a fun fact. A day's journey. But yeah. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Well, I'm not saying like how long, like length, like days, but I was just thinking like a Sabbath day journey is approximately three fourths of a mile. Oh. So think about that. So it's almost a whole mile. So, but back then they didn't have cars or anything. So like, picture walking a whole mile. You know, hit you know young adult young adults kids in high school they can typically run a mile. But they're fairly healthy around. 10, 12 minutes, that's running and they're young. So if you're older and you're walking it, that's gonna make the time go longer. So it could be maybe not a whole day journey, but you know. Um, but going back, yeah, the Sabbath, there's also those requirements. Like you can't do X, Y, and Z on, these, on this day. But another thing too, I was reading this. It's a free advertisement, the AP study Bible. And it brought up something pretty cool um, about it, specifically 112. So I want to go backwards. So it says they uh, then they return from return to Jerusalem from the Mount Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. So keep that in mind. It's kind of lengthy. Um, so what they say is, have you ever stopped to consider how uh, flexible people are when they're using geographical terms to describe somewhere they have been in the past or are going in the future? Oftentimes we discuss details regarding a particular geographical area. So like at town, cities, attractions within the regions. So in general terms um, are stated in place of exact locations. Keep that in mind. A person who lives in Sand Springs, Oklahoma, often will tell people he lives in Tulsa. Why? Because Sand Springs is a suburb and of Tulsa. And so more people have heard of Tulsa more so than Sand Springs. So kind of reiterates it. So considering how much leeway we allow ourselves today when speaking about the geographical regions, it is not surprising to find Bible writers using the same freedom in the documents. They wrote, although the skeptics also use the same approximate approximations that the Bible writers sometimes use, they arbitrarily reject the Bible writers information as being inaccurate and uninspired. The, the accusations has been made that Luke said Jesus ascended from the town of Bethany, but Acts explains that he went up from Mount Olive. So is this a contradiction? I know it's a lot of wording, but I always think these, when they point these contradictions out, because in today's world, people do that. They take these things out of context. Mm -hmm. Is this three fourths of a mile away? And they're pretty that close. They're so, and so that's what they, that's what they basically say is, you know, when we look more closely at this case, we discover that the inspired writer of the third gospel account actually wrote and he, Jesus, led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up to heaven. So that's back in Luke 24, 50 through 51. So notice that uh, he did not say that Jesus ascended from Bethany, but that he, has, he had gone as far. So Bethany... Uh, as far as Bethany, and from this point, Jesus ascended into heaven. The new and uh, the NIV seem to capture the real meaning of the verse, saying that Jesus took his apostles in the vicinity of Bethany before adding, uh, before ascending to heaven. And the text does not say that he ascended directly from Bethany. So that point aside, since Bethany was located just one and three four three quarters from Jerusalem on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. Luke merely used different geographical references to establish a location. The Gospel of Luke also does. So, so I know that was lengthy, but I think it's very important because I think these little snags like that, these little, well, Jesus is here in, in this book. He's there. And so what's going on? And, you know, as we said, Luke is part one to Acts, in a sense, they were together. It's kind of like if you have a movie sequel that contradicts each, you know, each other. 
you'll have someone like me, Sarah can attest, saying that's not what happened in the first movie. What's going on here? <laughs> and I'll complain. So I also thought it was a fun little fact to bring up those two things. Uh, I like to bring those things up because in today's world, especially with social media, everyone wants to just be right. And they always want to point things out without even thinking like, well, we do the same thing today. You know, like the Sand Spring, Oklahoma example. People will say, you know, we do that here. Trustful, Trustful Birmingham or Clay, Henson. So it was Birmingham. You know, we're Jefferson County. You know, we're all enclosed in Jefferson yeah, County. Birmingham. So we don't think about it like that. So that's just a fun little fact that I like to put up there. And so in verse 13, we look at, in this verse, uh, in this verse, the fourth, uh, the fourth listing of the apostles in the New Testament is given. So notice the following um, interesting facts about the list. So first one was, no two men were ever in the same order. I just, you know, when they're always listing this off, they're never in the same order, right? We look at the previous, you know, and we'll go through this. We may look at some of the other orderings, but why do I, but why do you think that them not being in the same order is significant? They asked all the time, who is greatest? Who's the greatest? When, yeah. when you put it in an order, you give greatness to that order uh -huh. if it's non alphabetical. Yeah. You know, generally, alphabetical helps it to where it's, it's ambiguous. <laughs> it's, it's not based on, you know, uh, Aaron Ash, you know, was placed because he has two A's in front of his name. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, it's not because he's better than you. Are. You know, and I think the fact that they're different orders actually shows what Jesus was saying was accurate. So they were no better than each other. That's great. And I want you to hammer that, but I also want us to look at this too, because I think this is where a lot of people get messed up, especially with the Catholic church. So Peter is listed first uh, in all four of those accounts that we look at it. Mm. So our, this fact is not to be used to exalt Peter above them. So Peter, so the Catholic Church is main main culprit. They always want to try to like be like he's the first pope. Well, Jesus said the last will be first and the first last. So mm -hmm. there you go. Well, Just, and then if you go to First Peter one one, you know, you know, it's by his own omission that he says that he's just an apostle and not a chief apostle. You know, we're, uh -huh. we don't have to read it, but just First Peter one one. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So he's not giving himself like a chief title. He's just saying, I'm an apostle. So here I am. You would think he would give himself a yeah. top. An apostle, not the apostle. Like the Acts, uh, you know, the Acts <clears throat> of the apostles are Acts of apostles. Notice how that same, you know, church, the Catholic church kind of did that. So the Acts of the Apostles, as we looked at the introduction, only four. And one of the people that we follow, Philip, isn't even an apostle. It's not the apostle Philip, it's the disciple Philip. Mm -hmm. So it's just also the most memorable one. He made a lot of mistakes. And yeah. so I that, he was just at the forefront of their mind. I would contend they with that because I think like, a lot oh, of people Peter. I think a lot of people now, you know, reference Paul more than Peter at times. Yeah. I think a lot of people look at Paul. It may, Peter may be more memorable. Like no, no, no. I'm just, I'm just saying when the writers made these lists, yeah. like, I just think they probably just put Peter first just because they were like, well, duh, Peter. Because I feel like Peter was one of those people super confident. I think know, it also goes back to maybe out, the so. Peter, the constantly trying to, you know, he was always yeah, the first yeah. to say always, something. Yeah. Well, also, he, he led, I mean, in John 20, he said, this is the second time he's already seen Jesus ascend. Uh-huh. He's already seen him twice, and he says, I'm going fishing, and the rest of them come with him. <laughs> and the, the third time he sees Jesus is when Jesus tells him to haul in the fish, and he he feeds him. He says, do you love me more than these? He's asking him about the fish. Yeah. So he said, feed my sheep. G Jesus selected Peter, selected all of them. I think sometimes we react to the papacy, you know, assigning of Peter and saying, the, saying he's first, and we just go the other way. No, Jesus still selected Peter to be an influence to, uh -huh. to the brethren, and yet he still caused brethren to, to stumble, you know, in Galatians 2, 
you know, he he didn't always have it right. And, uh, and if you look at, you know, if we look at uh, 1 Peter 5, 1, you know, that also referenced him. He's just being a fellow elder among elders. He's not yeah. a chief elder either. And we have that today. There's no, like, chief elder, you know. Who's I learned the chief this. elder? Huh? The chief elder here mm-hmm. is Jesus. When yeah. the chief elder appears, you'll receive a crown of glory. Yeah, the chief Jesus elder is chief. Is, yeah, but there's there's not, like, one. Really. Right. No, no. Yeah. I was just, well, yeah. I'm, I'm adding to your point. Yeah. I'm not Because I learned this the other – I learned this a while back because I, I came up here one day <laughs> when I wasn't really supposed to. And Rick gave me a uh, a smoothie or something from Arby's. I was like, yeah, thank you, Rick. But apparently the elders here, they rotate, you know, who's who's in charge each month. Right. So so like one month, I'm like, Skip, I need you. I, I want to do this. Can I? He's like, I'm not in charge right now. You, to, to you know why he did that? They couldn't shake hands, so he brought shakes. Yeah. Is that not awesome? Oh. Anyway. I didn't. I was so proud. That was that was wonderful. But he gave me one. I was like, oh. another fun fact that kind of disputes the whole Peter being like a another thing was uh, the other apostles were given the same authority as Peter you see that you know so Peter's not like going around saying I'm I got this authority over you like all the apostles were given the same authority that's why we see the disputes between Peter and Paul um that's in Matthew in Matthew 16 18 through 19 if y'all want to look at that um, he instructed those who sin to pray to God, not to him, for forgiveness, which we see a lot of people pray to saints or you know, in a similar manner. You just kind of pray to God. You don't pray to the demon. Um, he refused to accept men bowing down before him and worshiping him, as we'll see in Acts 10. Paul rebuked him when he sinned by being a hypocrite in Galatia 2, 11 through 14. So even... Uh, uh, Peter's the chief. Paul shouldn't be able to review. He shouldn't have that fight. He should he should just take it. And then, <laughs> like the other apostles, he had the right to have a wife, and indeed he had one. So we see the popes and the clergy and everything, and you know the Catholic Church and also the Orthodox Church, I believe, the Greek Orthodox and other sects. They say you can't get married. You're gonna do these type of things. But we see the example. Peter was married. Yeah, Peter was married. And so, Alex, can you read? We're going to read these last three verses, and then I'm going to give a fun fact, and then we'll close out with a prayer. So, we right. give Matthew 10, 2 through 4. The names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, uh, Simon the Zealot, and Jesus Scarlet, who betrayed him. Okay. Now, who's got Mark 3, 14 and 21? I've got that. And he appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the 12, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name uh, Bonergus, to that, uh, that is, sons of thunder, Andrew and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, and, and Simon the Zealot. And Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Uh, then he went home, and the crowd gathered again, so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he's out of his mind. All right. Luke 6, 13 through 16. Sarah? 
And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, whom he named apostles, Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew his brother, and James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon who was called the Zealot, and Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. All right, so fun fact. We read through all those. We read all four of the listings of the apostles. Obviously, Peter's listed first, right? Each one. So here is the fun fact to show why that doesn't make Peter significant. And all those listings, Philip is listed fit, uh, fifth in all four. James, the son of Alphaeus, is listed ninth in all four. There's no, there's no reason for the order. It's just what they did. And so if someone tries to use the ordering of listing the apostles as the making Peter more of a significant person than the others, we've referenced other accounts, you know, of Peter saying, no, I'm not the chief. Uh, I'm, you know, showing that he's equal among the elders. But have them read all four of the listings and then bring that fact up. Well, what's Philip then? Philip's fifth in all four. Is, what's the significance of that? James, the son of Alphaeus, is listed ninth in all four. What's the significance of that? Because there's 12. It's just the order. Maybe they put Peter up front, yes, because he's a more memorial figure. But that's probably just it. There's no significance. And so I think that's just a fascinating fact. Matthew 16 account. He says, you are Peter, and on this rock open my church. It's mm -hmm. based on his confession. We've discussed that at length in the mm -hmm. past. But he says, and, and um, then he says, and I will give you the keys to the kingdom. I looked at it. The you is singular there. So he's only telling Peter. Mm -hmm. That's where they get it. Yeah. He says, I will give you the keys to the kingdom. That's why when they tell a joke and St. Peter, where is he? He's at the gate because he's got the keys. So that's where they get, that's where the even jokes come from. Yeah. So I give you the keys of the kingdom and whatever you singular bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And what, whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven, but it's not singling him out. It's because he said you are the Christ. Uh -huh. And so he gives him those, those keys to the kingdom, you know, but that's not just Peter. That's all Everybody. the apostles. Yeah. That's why all of them receive the Holy spirit on the day of Pentecost. Mm -hmm. He's only singling him out because he was the one that made the statement. And maybe that's also why he's listed first, because he was the one that made the statement as well. What was that? I said maybe that's why he's listed first in all the listings, because it's known that he was the one that... But I just think it's a fun fact. Next time someone tries to use the ordering as a reason to make Peter, you know, more significant, just let him know, like, Philip, he's fifth in all of them. James, son of Alphaeus, he's ninth. What's, what's, what's the importance of that then? Right. I think we, we take these rankings like this too serious at times. Good point. And we try to make it like that. So I'm going to end it with that fun little fact. And Skip, if you could, could you lead us in a closing prayer? God, Father in heaven, we're you know, thankful for this opportunity to come and study your word and help us, O oh Lord, to uh, study your word each and every day. Um, and apply it to our, to our lives. Help us, O Lord, to bring others along this journey with us. Help us always be searching out those that are lost and, and that need Jesus. And, and uh, Lord, just uh, help us to be able to approach them and, and uh, show them the way of, and the truth in the, the life. Well, Lord, bless the, this congregation uh, and of your people. Help us always do what is right. Uh, help us always to serve you a little more and a little better each and every day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.